Please open your Bibles to the book of Jude. To the book of Jude. If you go to the end of your Bible and find the book of Revelation, take a left. The book of Jude. It has one chapter. Place your bookmark in that one chapter. That's where we'll be for the majority of our lesson tonight. Jude 1 and those first 19 verses. I appreciate so much being able to be together again this evening. Sundays are the best day of the week. I enjoy getting to spend time worshiping our God and Father in heaven, and I enjoy spending time in His Word. So I appreciate so much you being here and joining in this study tonight. Jude, verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude, while it is the second shortest epistle in the New Testament, it may have more controversial statements than some of the bigger books in the New Testament. We're going to cover a couple of them tonight. I am not going to scratch all of your, your curiosities with this text. If you have ever read Jude 1 through 19, you probably are already familiar with some of the things we're going to read tonight, and guess what? Devin doesn't have the answer for those. But I do want us to, ve- to zero in on the precise point Jude is trying to make because it is pointed, and I think it is helpful, and I think it is relevant for our culture today. That phrase, to earnestly contend, and for some reason it is backwards on the title. I don't know what happened there. But earnestly contend. Our culture really has all ends of the extremes. We have people that will allow themselves to be bulldozed. They will not stand up for themselves. They will not stand up for a cause. They will not defend their position. And then you have the other extreme of people who go out of their way to defend their position when nobody was trying to argue with them. And then you have a lot of people that fall right there in the middle. Our faith, our faith is one thing, folks, that every single Christian is called to defend. There is no pacifism in the Christian faith. There is no neutrality in the war for truth. We must be the people that while we do not go out looking for a fight... We are ready for a fight. We are ready to defend our faith, to contend, fight, strive for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That needs to describe you. It better describe me. Not because I am an evangelist, but because I am a follower of King Jesus. We fight faithfully for the faith. But we fight wisely. The Christian is not afraid to be offensive, but is not recklessly offensive for no reason. The gospel is offensive enough. We are not unnecessarily so. Evil doers and false teaching must be rejected and sent out of the church because if we don't do things like that, it will destroy the church. I want to talk about what Jude's point is in his epistle. Right there it is. I've got five things from this text that I think will be helpful as we try to pick it apart and figure out what we need to do with it in our culture today. Jude, verse 3, earnestly content. Let me give you five things tonight. Number one, there's only one, and it has been delivered. Look at verse 3 again. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation... I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. This is a problem, folks, that has been around since the first gospel preaching. You go and read Paul's epistle to South Galatia, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. He says, I marvel that you're turning so soon from the gospel. Folks, there's only one gospel. And he says, you better stick to it. He says, even if someone comes along and preaches to you another gospel, even if he is an apostle or an angel, 
If it doesn't harmonize with the revealed truth of God, reject it. I want you to think, folks, if something like that was happening, and I'm going to say about A.D. 50 is when Galatians was written, maybe a little before, maybe a little after. If something like that was happening in the first century world, don't you think it still happens today, folks? People going around perverting the gospel message. But Jude here says there's only one and it has already been delivered. There's no later date revelations. We're not waiting for God to reveal something new. It's here. It's now. It's present. And it is not going to be redacted anytime soon. I want you to consider, look at 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. Part of the faith, that is that system of doctrine, the gospel of Jesus Christ, what it demands, what it entails, it brings holy requirements from a holy God. But when you think about the fact that there is one revealed standard and it has already been delivered, that means there won't be changes anytime soon. I want you to just think of these, these verses here. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I want you to understand something, folks. These things God has already identified. He has already specified. They won't make the cut. Individuals living this lifestyle will not make the cut. God has revealed that truth. And it is not going to change. The temptation for our culture is no different than the temptation of the first century culture. When God says something we don't like a whole lot, what are we all, what are we all tempted to do? We're tempted to take out the sharpie. Uh, that part doesn't apply to me. Folks, statements like Jude verse 3 remind us you don't get the exception. God's rules have been revealed. There is one standard of holy conduct and you are bound to it just like I am. It's been revealed. It's been revealed. But, but with that, I don't want to just you know, hammer on some old nasty stuff that nobody likes and, and very few people in here would practice anyways or be tempted to practice anyways. We get all of the sins in verses 9 and 10. Probably not a lot of people in this room tonight that are sitting here thinking, man, I'd really like to go outside and do some of this stuff. But part of the message of the gospel is verse 11, too. Such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. My friends, the sins that are described in verses 9 and 10, which are so prevalent in first, or 21st century America, can still be forgiven by the one gospel that has been delivered. That is one, the one gospel that has been revealed. The one gospel that is unchanging. Folks, God doesn't change His rules for any culture. We must respect this. There is only one, and it has been delivered. Number two. Number two. Some seek to undermine it. Go back to Jude, verse 4. Jude, verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our Lord Jesus, or grace of our God into licentiousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, certain men have crept in unnoticed, long ago marked out for this condemnation. Now, don't, don't misunderstand the text that mean, oh, well, God had predetermined that this fella who's teaching this is going to lose their soul. That's not his point. His point is this type of fella, the individual who wants to go out and pervert the gospel, the individual who wants to lead people away from the single truth, that person is a type of people who went before him and they who meet that description, will be judged severely, strongly by God. Folks, the desire to reinterpret the text is nothing new. 
When you read sections like we just read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, folks, that, how many cultures came before us that said, well, I don't like what God says there. Maybe what we should do is reinterpret that. See, the word fornicator in the Greek, well, that really means this, and that really means that. and that. Well, and, But in, in the Hebrew, it has this kind of a meaning here. You ever had a conversation like that? It's individuals who don't like what the text says. And so they want to just make all sorts of arguments about what it, what it probably says, what it really means. Have somebody sit down with you and discuss Matthew 19. When Jesus says, there's only one exception for divorce. The rule. There's only one exception for divorce. In the, in the event of somebody committing adultery. Well, boy, now you're sitting across the table from Greek scholars all of a sudden. Because they, well, that word there means this and that, and this also over here too, and let's read this book and that book. No, 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 quit making excuses. Let's just go back to the text. Folks, this is nothing new. There's always been people and organizations that will tell you and gladly tell you, well, that text really means this. Well, new evidence shows this verse doesn't really mean what it very clearly says. It is efforts to mold the message to match modern meanings and mindsets. And that will get you into trouble every single time. Let me give you a couple of more modern examples of that. Institutions that were historically conservative. I want you to understand, this is why I stress all the time, we are not part of the Church of Christ denomination. Does everybody follow that? We are not a denomination in this congregation. That's not who we are. So the United Church of Christ denomination... Their position on abortion. Well, they support abortion rights with few or no limits. Did you know that? That's an institution that I would assume historically was pretty conservative on points like that. Maybe the United Methodist Church, quote, supports abortion rights with some limits, end quote. You see, organizations historically taking conservative positions, and then as time progresses... They take softer positions. Do I even need to bring up the LGBTQ stuff? Where's the Methodist church on that? Well, let me just tell you, historically they were conservative and against things like that. Viewed them as perversions from God's word. What's happening now? See, our standard is not people and our standard is not organizations. Our standard is the book. Our standard is the word of God. The faith that was once for all delivered. And we need to be aware of people that try to pervert this. Listen to this text very carefully. This is Jeremiah 5, and I like the way Jeremiah words this. Jeremiah 5 and verse 12. They have lied about the Lord and said it is not He. Neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. And the prophets become wind. For the word is not in them, thus shall it be done to them. You notice... Jeremiah describes individuals who are speaking for God. Or at least supposedly they are speaking for God. But what is Jeremiah the inspired prophet saying? They are not speaking the truth. So he says in verse 14, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and this people would and it shall devour them. God says, I'm going to take care of that. This is nothing new, folks. This is why in the Old Testament there are warning after war there's warning after warning after warning about what to do with a false prophet, that is individuals, who try to pervert the sim simplicity of the message of God. There are some out there who seek to undermine His message. Be aware of that and guard yourself against it. Number three, the Lord saves and the Lord destroys. Look at the text of Jude, verse 5. Jude verse 5. He says, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. 
And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil dignitaries. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed over the body of Moses, dared not bring, uh, bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak, ev- these speak evil of what they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them! For they have gone in the way of Cain, run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. I probably had you really, really good, didn't I? Right until we got to those readings. And now you're thinking, what did we just read? It's okay, you can join the club. So what about angels? Well, what about the devil? He's described here. Is verse 6 describing the devil? Is that somehow the devil's fall? Is this Lucifer or something? Uh, I have no idea. Michael and Satan contending for the body of Moses. What's happening there? Again, I do not know. Several of these are recorded events. Several are not. I will say, because it comes up, there are a lot of people that turn to this text and they talk about Lucifer. If you go back and read Isaiah 14 and, and you read the statement about Lucifer who fell, you go read... Isaiah 13, and the beginning of Isaiah 14, Isaiah is talking about the king of Babylon. I think Lucifer is the king of Babylon in the, in the context. I don't think that's another name for Satan. And if, I, if you think that's heresy, we can talk about it after class tonight, but that's neither here nor there for the moment. What is clear is what's stated in verse 5 that sets up the discussion. God saved people out of the land of Egypt, God destroyed those who did not believe. That's the context. So everything that's stated after that is about God dealing out judgment. What about the angels going on in verse 6? Doesn't matter. The point is God dealt with them too. What's happening with Sodom and Gomorrah being mentioned in this passage? Well, we know that account from the book of Genesis. What happened is God dealt with them too. What about verse 9? Michael acknowledges God will deal with this too. What's the text really about? God dealing with sin. There we go. We don't have to get all into the superstitious stuff. By the way, you can search this text on, on, on the Google, and you're going to get all kinds of crazy stuff. But what's the text talking about? God handling sin. God's going to deal with it. God saves the faithful, and he destroys the faithless. The the quicker we come to terms with that, the better off we're going to be, folks. Because we get to decide which one we are. We get to decide which one we're going to be in this whole description here. We get to decide whether or not we're going to be part of those who are saved by the Lord or whether we're going to be those who are destroyed by the Lord. Our culture wants us to apologize for God and His judiciary action, but my friends, we will not. God's going to destroy sinners. How does that make you feel? God's going to save those who will bow their knees to King Jesus. How does that make you feel? I want you to understand, folks, we, we need to accept the truth. As Jude says, it has been once delivered. Paul says, God, he says, he will give you trouble. Or excuse me, he he will give uh, give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified with His saints 
and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Again, He will be glorified. And all those who are faithful to Him will be glorified, will be with Him in that day. And all those who stand opposed to Him will be judged, just like Egypt in the Exodus, just like the angels who left their proper habitation, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, just like Satan when he opposed Michael over the body of Moses. God will destroy those who oppose Him. Don't oppose God. Number four. I know this is one of your favorite questions. Well, what about the hypocrites? Look at verse 12. This is back in the text of Jude. Back in Jude, verse 12. These are spots in your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, tending only themselves, they are clouds without water carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea foaming up their own shame, wandering stars from whom, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints." to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. I know you already have more questions running through your head now. What's the love feast? What's Enoch doing here? And I have all sorts of answers for you again. I don't know. Can I make a caution, though? Verse 12 has been used by some to try to defend local churches providing fellowship social meals. That's not what's going on in this text. That's not even a second, that's not even a 30-second cousin to what's going on in this text. In fact, I think we can make a better argument that what he's talking about is a figurative thing. I, I make that point because... He's describing these individuals who are against God. And he says, they are clouds without water. Is that literal? Well, surely not. So what he's talking about is a figurative thing. These are individuals who are closely connected to you, interwoven into your congregation with you. They look like you. And Jude says they are not part of you. In fact, he says they are spots. They are hidden reefs, the New American Standard says. They are hidden reefs. What do hidden reefs do? They cause shipwrecks, folks, because ships can't see them until they're already on top of them and the hole is damaged and taking on water. That's what he describes these individuals as. They are imposters in the local church. I want you to understand, folks, look at verse 15. What about these imposters? What about these hypocrites that play the part but are not authentic? Verse 15, he will execute judgment on all. God will handle the hypocrites. God will handle the play actors who look the part but are not authentic, are not truly faithful to King Jesus. God will handle them. So what do we do with that? I mean, do we keep everybody at an arm length? Well, we, you know, we're not really sure if they're faithful. I don't think that they're faithful. I'm not really, you know, we just push them over here. No, 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 no. We try even harder to reach people like that, knowing that God will sort it all out in the end. We reach harder for these people. We avoid bad people. There's no question about that. Jude's admonishing that, exhorting that principle. But what we do is we try to help these people. And when, we are, when it is obvious that they are bad, that they are the shipwreck causers, Then we push them away. Then we save ourselves. Number five. Number five. We remember the word of God. Look at verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking according to their own lust and their own and their own mouth, speaks great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, 
Remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are the sensual ones who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. This is an acknowledgement that God is not caught off guard. Did God not realize there were going to be hypocrites among His people? Uh, sure, God realized there were going to be hypocrites among His people. Did God not realize there were going to be people who taught false things? Of course God realized there were going to be people who taught false things. And that is why He warns His people. We be careful about what we hear. These individuals are murmurers. They are complainers. An individual said, Whenever a man gets out of touch with God he is likely to begin complaining about something. This grumbling extended to, to their lot in life. They were always cursing their luck. These are literally fault finders. The ancient world had people just like this. One of the cynics of the ancient Greco-Roman world said, You're satisfied by nothing that befalls you. You complain at everything. You don't want what you've got. You long for what you haven't got. In winter, you wish it were summer, and in summer, you wish it were winter. You are like the sick folk, hard to please. You are a fault finder. That's almost 2,000 years old. Not a lot's changed. Have you looked at Facebook today? We've got some of those same people living and moving right now. Not happy about anything. Complaining about everything. That can't describe the Christian. That can't describe the person who's following God, who's following the truth that was once, and all, once for all delivered. What do we do? We stick to the Word. We remember the words of the apostles. We remember the words spoken by God. Remember the words should be our slogan. We remember the truth revealed. We look at what we've got and we stick to it. We earnestly contend for it. I'm going I'm to admit, that is just one of the toughest texts I've ever tried to preach through. Which is part of why I enjoy preaching through text. Because, oh, let me just let me be honest, it'd be really, really easy to look at a text like that and think, I'm going to mention verse 3 and not talk about the rest of that stuff. Um, but sometimes it's helpful. Because you take a hard text where there's lots of stuff going on and you think, well, I don't really know what's happening here and I don't really know what's happening here. Sometimes it can be helpful to just look at it and say, what's the big thing? If we are going to preach through that text, what does Jude want us to get? Well, I think Jude wants us to get some stuff, folks. Some of the stuff we've talked about. There's only one gospel. It's already been delivered. Yeah, there are people in the world who want to pervert it, who want to change it or corrupt it. God will sort out all of that. He will save those who are faithful and He will destroy those who are unfaithful. He will handle the hypocrites. What we better do then is remember the Word and stick to it. Amen. That's why he begins the epistle by saying to contend earnestly for the faith. And I put it in the right order then. To contend earnestly for the faith. Are you contending for the faith? Is this something that you're fighting for? Is it something you consider to be worth fighting for? If it's not, if it's something we can help you with, assist you with tonight, here's your chance. You can make it known now as we stand and as we sing.